Welcome to Fort Knox. It's a double header today. Uh, I'm here with Phaedra Ellis Lampkins this time, the co-founder and CEO of Promise. Um, excited to talk to you. It's a very different sort of company born out of your work in sort of, I don't know how best to put it, overlooked communities, people who often are not given a seat at the table, um, kind of following on, on your work in unions and all kinds uh, of ways of empowering people. So uh, I always start off asking about today's toughest problem that leaders are grappling with. So what would you say is the toughest problem that you're grappling with today? Uh, the toughest problem is we're working to build a model in a system that is mostly predatory, right? We're building financial services for low wage and uh, working people. And it's really difficult because if you think about lending people money for short terms, that would be 36% interest. If you think about um, how, how do you help people make as much money as possible and with the least amount of consequences, it's just a hard problem because there's not a lot of places to look. It's not, when we first started, I was like, who, what's a great company that is doing no harm and actually improving people's life? And people would be like, Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> Like is, that, is, like, is the best model we have uh, in terms of how to build a company that is sustainable and that works for working people uh, and people of color is Ben and Jerry's, we're in trouble. So l let me back up uh, because we should tell people what Promise is today, which is a bit different from how it started, right? Yeah. But still serving the, some of the same population. It's, it's in a way it's FinTech. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's payments oriented, but yeah. giving that capability uh, to you know groups of people who who haven't always had it. So what are you what is Promise doing right now? Yeah, um, Promise is installment plans for government debt. So we make bill paying easier for individuals. Um, so when you can't afford your water bill and your water's about to be shut off, instead of having your water shut off we work with a water utility to do zero interest installment plans. So you both keep your water on and you're able to have a flexible repayment plan. And so that's the easiest way to think about what we do. And in addition to making it easier to pay, we also work with government to make it easier to get relief. So because a lot of people were impacted by COVID, you um, were able to get federal funds. And so we think about how to make that as easy as possible. So you can go to our site, you can click on a link, answer three questions, and part of your debt is forgiven. And so it's all about making it easier to pay your bills so you don't think the consequences of government debt. So in a way, I mean, we talk a lot on CNBC about buy now, pay later. In a way, this is that that kind of, I don't even want to say convenience, because here it's not just convenience, it's relief for yeah. a different population that's not so much trying to, to, to buy uh, yeah. as to live. Yeah, maybe the better way to say is keep it, pay later. And so keep your water on, keep your driver's license, um, because the consequences of not paying government debt are pretty significant. And so, but it is that same flexibility um, without interest. And when you started, you were more focused on uh, payments connected to the justice system, mm -hmm. right? And uh, whether it be traffic tickets or, or other things, it, yep. it could be um, just inconvenience payment issues would end up causing people way more trouble than they had to. Um, so tell me how how the business has evolved since then. Yeah. I mean, when we first started, we started focused on the criminal justice system. And what we found is a lot of people were entering the criminal justice system because of fees and fines or because of debt. Right. And the highest risk we were in Michigan and looking at the numbers, the highest risk folks were people who had a suspended driver's license. And that was like a lot of people I grew up with, right? A lot of people I knew were driving, you know, cause they couldn't afford a ticket. They didn't pay their registration and they just kept driving. And so we thought like, that doesn't feel like that should be the highest risk person in a criminal justice system. And so we wanted to understand how and why. And so when you we say went, highest risk, what do you mean? Uh, the, as you think about things like bail, you're basically rated on who's least likely to show up for court. And in this county in Michigan, the people who are least likely to show up for court were people who had a suspended driver's license. And you could either believe it's because they're serious criminals or you could think they're moms and dads driving their kids to school, driving to work, trying to manage their lives. And for us, 
we believed that it wasn't that people didn't have the intent to pay, which is how the system is structured right now. It's a punitive system because someone doesn't want to do something. Our belief was that people wanted to pay. They didn't have the means. So the system needed to be restructured. And um, and so so that's how we ended up there. As we said, look, here's who's highest risk. So they're going to get treated the poorest. And then we said, who are those people? Mo mostly a lot of black men, a lot of young black men. And um, and then we said, well, what happens if you can't pay it? How does the system respond? And so we looked at the city of Oakland it's since changed. But at the time we said, what if I can't afford to pay a ticket? And they said, well, first you have to come into the office. And so it means I have to take time off of work. I had to go into the office and I had to pay to park. And then I had to bring a copy of my taxes to prove I was poor for the worthiness of paying my ticket. And, and you had to owe a certain amount. So you already let, had to let fees and fines accumulate to be able to pay someone back with interest and come in the office and have taxes. And so we just thought that seems ridiculous. It's in, in the same way, if you think about how Peloton has said, what? Okay, you wanna buy a Peloton? Zero interest, just come to our website. But if you're poor, it's like, what? You have a ticket and there's serious consequences? Prove you're poor, come in the office. It has to already have fees and fines. And we just thought that was not a system that was structured for people to succeed. So what's the incentive for anybody to solve that problem? So often when we talk about uh, companies and you've been in Silicon Valley for a long time, you know, people are looking for problems to be solved, but not just problems to be solved, problems that they can get paid to solve. And so often, though, there are these challenges, problems in, in society that technology could solve, but there's so little financial incentive to solve them. How did you look at this one? Was there a financial incentive or did you go in with a principle and just sort of yeah. trust that a financial benefit would would find its way to you? Uh, well, first, I think the problem is not I, I might think of the problem a little differently, which is it's not just the financial problem. It's that people are creating technology for the things that impact their own lives. And so I used to run revenue at a tech company. What I realized is I'd be with a lot of other folks who are running revenue at unicorn companies. And everyone was like, dry cleaning. I'm so tired of not being able to my dry cleaning. Valet parking. It was like the problems that people were addressing were problems that were important to them. And I just didn't see people who look like me. And so I was like, I grew up, these are the problems with the people I grew up with. And so I think it isn't just the financial incentive. It's that it's not a compelling problem to people who haven't experienced the consequences of poverty. And so first is I wanted to solve it because my my folks needed it. And then once I committed to solving it, there weren't a lot of models because there's a lot of predatory models for um, financial services for low income people because it's easiest. But um, and that's why we thought government was important because we knew government had an incentive to get it right. And if we could prove it with government that you can give poor people, you can make it easy, you can give them more time, you can provide flexibility, that if we could prove there was a higher repayment, then you could talk to the private market. But we knew it was much easier to make that case with government. But I just think it's people solve problems that they care about. And, and I just think there's not enough people creating technology who care about these things because they didn't experience them. How do you um, make people aware of the availability of promise? It, does, it, does it go through the government and government agencies? How do you spread um, the uh, agency adoption? How do you incentivize the agency adoption so that you can get in more places and, and offer the, the services to more uh, people who need them? Yeah, well, we're really lucky in that once I think uh, uh, there's been some studies done on our work, so they think that's been an important way for people to find out about us. And um, and governments uh, basically say to, they give us a file and say, here's all the people who are behind and need help. And then we reach out directly. They put us on their website. Um, one of my favorite ways is we often have people put our numbers on Facebook. Like one person gets helped and there's like the community connection where We'll all of phone our phones start ringing. We're like, oh, okay. And we'll be like, wait, where did you find out? Okay, my friend saw it on Facebook. And we'll see like one person, it'll get shared 1,500 times. It'll be like, get your bill paid here. <laughs> and so the way that folks find out about us is the mayors have press conferences. We're on their website. We reach out to people directly. It's on their bill. Um, but also it's word of mouth uh, and people who get help. Is there a name for this category of of company of effort because a few months ago i had on uh, rohan pavaluri the the ceo of upsolve and mm -hmm. you know they're helping 
people go through the bankruptcy process so mm -hmm. that they're not mired in in uh, debt and caught in the system. And it seems like uh, there's perhaps a growing cohort of technologies of companies that are working to solve these sort of social financial mm -hmm. uh, challenges. Is is there a term for that? Is there? Do you guys hang out and like and and brainstorm and what's going on? I love it. Um, uh, I don't know that there's a name, and it really just is technology for people who are poor, black, and brown, right? You it's not come up with something catchy. It's that. like like technology for people who deserve and need it. <laughs> and uh, something shorter, I'm thinking. We got right, to yeah, work on that. Because people will be like social impact, and I'm like, I don't know if it's social impact to not harm people. Like, like technology should be used to actually improve people's life. It's just we don't usually do it for poor people. Um, it, I, I definitely think there is a. I think two things are shifting. One, you're starting to see entrepreneurs that are having more access to capital that care about these issues, and so I think that's important. And I also think, frankly, government is starting to. Um, regulate much more bad companies. And so you're starting to see much more regulation around kind of the, you know, the the things like where you get, you know, pull some money from your before you get paid and have high monthly fees, but technically it's free. Like, I think there's also a lot of regulation happening. And so those two things are forcing, I think, companies to adapt. Um, and I definitely think there's a group of entrepreneurs who care about the problems that we see as most central to the world. And they're like Donnell, who runs Block Power. There, you know, like there's a lot of us who are thinking about, you know, he's thinking about broadband, and we're thinking, okay, how could we help get the word out about free broadband? Can we tell our clients? How do we think about uh, student loan forgiveness? Like, how do you make sure that people have a, a a place that they can get all of this information centralized? I'm going to come up with something. Okay, maybe good. I, I, I would love it. Just tech, or you know, tech for just—I I don't know uh, something. Uh, and, and I wonder, there should be a conference. There should be something where people get together, right, and and come up with the ideas and the best practices, and uh, the investors can come in and give you guys money. There needs to be something like. I, am, am I missing it? Is it there? And I'm and I'm just not seeing it. I don't. I feel like I'm a heads down person, and so I I don't know that I would know if there was a conference. And I've been in tech, but I didn't come out of tech, and so like, and I didn't go to like an Ivy League school, so I'm just like. Move it. There might be. I just wasn't invited. <laughs> Maybe there was a big secret conference. See, you're too. You're too busy working on stuff. You're not I, trying to. I don't know what's. I. I like. I don't know. I'm. I'm still working on Twitter. So you know who knows. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk some more about that. But now mm -hmm. that we've uh, gotten a bit about promise and the the group that it's serving and and the need for it mm -hmm. uh, and what the mission is. I want to learn more about you because um, we sort of referred to that uh, a little bit. But I like to start at the very beginning, get a sense of where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, siblings. Um, yeah, I grew up. My sister and I were born to my mama, who was a waitress, and uh, grew up in the North Bay, born in San Francisco. And um, I think a lot about having a, I think there's something very clear about growing up poor and um, and understanding the lack of dignity that sometimes people give you when you're poor. And so for me, it was like having free lunch. Like when you got free lunch, you were in a different line than everyone else who paid or their parents brought at lunch or having free cheese and free peanut butter. And so I think a lot about the lack of dignity as a kid and how I felt using food stamps or Medi-Cal or, or other things. And I, I want better for other people. Um, and, um, and so that's how I grew up. Uh, loved and um, and lucky. I was uh, lucky to get to be have a lot of opportunity because I was smart. And so, and um, in San Francisco proper, I was born in San Francisco proper at General Hospital in San Francisco. I was like San Francisco proper, not the suburbs. I was born in San Francisco. <laughs> uh, nothing to discredit anyone else, but I was born in San Francisco. Um, so tell and, me, and your sister, older or younger? Younger. Okay. Uh, how much? Uh, four years. I'm the. I ha, I also have other sisters, but uh, I'm the oldest. I mean, can you? I'm the oldest. <laughs> I can believe that. I can believe that. I'm the I'm oldest. Not gonna, I'm not going to put that on you. Are you the oldest? Uh, or are you in your birth order? I'm the youngest. 
Oh, that's okay. Good to yeah. know. Okay, you're the youngest. So I can so I can recognize an oldest because Katie, yeah, that's what I was like. I was like, okay, I see it now. Youngest. Okay, I got <laughs> because it. I am not the old. So um what what were you into as a kid? We touched on some of the challenges, but what got you excited? Um, I was always uh one, I was always a nerd and really into reading. So I really like to read. And I always felt strongly about justice. So I was active. Um, like help organize a walkout in my high school, um, felt really compelled about especially workers' rights um, as a young person and um, always had to work. And so I was very clear um, about those issues. But I, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a civil rights attorney. I was like, I'm going to be a civil rights attorney. Um, and so that's what I thought. It's what I wanted to be. And then what were, uh, what were the books around the house when you say, you know, you were a nerd? Uh, I, I have a little experience with that. And, you know, we had we had books around the house that I would read. I would pick up, you know, um, uh, Richard Wright's Black Boy was around the house. Uh, oh, oh my he, goodness. He, so lucky. Yeah, he almost lit the curtains on fire. Well, he did light the curtains on fire. He <laughs> lit the house on fire. And, uh, and Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I think it was maybe my grandfather's collection of Edgar Allan Poe. Poe books, an old dusty set. My, my parents actually just sent that to me for me to have, but like 1906 edition. Oh. I, know, I used to read the, yeah. So either around the house or the library, where were the books coming from for Nerd Phaedra growing up? I love that. Definitely the library. The library had a program where if you like read a certain number of books over the summer, you got a free ticket to a baseball game. And so I was always trying to like get as many books as possible. And um, it was like my version of sports <laughs> is read as many books as possible. So I was definitely a library kid and always really interested in civil rights and um, um, studying about uh, civil rights and also the labor movement and weirdly interested in Latin America and Latin American politics. Um, and so I, I too read Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and so I was just like, I wonder if that uh, the dreariness of that he did. And um, and I was really interested in like somewhat black radical reading like Eldridge Cleaver and um, got a lot of stuff like around me, a lot of like autobiographies and biographies became very interesting to me. I, was that in the social environment a bit? Because when I think about Oakland at the time, I think about, okay, yeah, uh, th that makes sense. And then maybe even the interest in labor and Cesar Chavez and sort of that being a part of what was talked about in California. Is that some of what sparked that? Um, it's interesting. It definitely wasn't my social environment of my my family, uh, uh, but it definitely was. I think like when I was growing up, the boycott was happening in with Cesar Chavez. And there definitely was, I think, much more conversation in California public schools about injustice and especially in the Bay Area. And so I think it was there were norms about what was right and what was wrong that I might not have had if I was somewhere else. And also um, talking about injustice was a, was rewarded. You know, like we walked out of school, we didn't get in trouble, we didn't get suspended. You know, like we we got affirmed. And so it was just, it was a it was a very different environment. So I think in that way it was social. Um, you know, our principal- What'd you walk out for? We walked, I don't even remember what we walked, something was going on with the school I think, I don't know if it was curriculum or something, but it was something that, that we just believed was unjust. And um, yeah, it was, we just believed it was unjust. I don't even remember. I mean, now, you know, that was 30 years ago, 25 years ago, it was a long time ago. Uh, you, you and I were born the same year. I know exactly how long ago it was. <laughs> I too led a walk out of my high school, but we you won't did? go into that. This, yeah, this right. isn't about me. Uh, uh, in DC, on the other side of the country. Yeah, oh, we, I love it. Yeah, we were, we were dealing with that. So um, you, you were interested in uh, labor rights, you were saying, and you said you always had to work. What kind of work uh, were you doing and, and um, how did those environments affect your point of view? Um, I... Um, well, I first, my first job was a tutor. I was a tutor at school, which I loved. And then I worked at a grocery store for a long time. I bagged and then I was a clerk. And my mom, I always wanted to be a waitress, but my mom, because I always thought you make a lot of tips. And my mom was always very clear. You'll never be like, she was a waitress. So she was like this, you'll never be a waitress. Um, and so, uh, and then I started to learn working with books. I uh, really liked working with books. 
Um, and then I was an intern in the labor movement, which I think was the most transformative moment for me is, and then I just kept working in the labor movement in college um, and then ended up working there afterwards. But it was really, um, it was that, but you know, my, I had a pretty diverse work experience and I liked working. So um, it was, you know, I was always really lucky. How did the labor connection start? Was that pre-college? Was that during college? Um, it was, it was pre, I always had a sense of like how, what, how I thought the world should be ordered. And so being in the labor movement felt like my, for me, my mom had been a waitress, like I said, and then had gone back to school and then she got her first job, which was a union job. And so it was transformative for us. I went from free to reduced lunch. Um, we could afford much more than we had before and, so I always attributed unions with like transformation. And um, and so I, I wanted that for other people and um, went into the labor movement in college as an intern and working with organizing. And I was very much compelled by, I was trying to organize uh, home care workers and I kept working to get this guy to join a home care union and he just wouldn't join. It was $7 a month. And if it, it, I finally realized that even though he knew the union would be better for him, he couldn't afford the $7 a month. And that was transformative also for me realizing like, even when you know something is better, if you just can't afford the $7, you just can't afford the $7. And I was working in East Palo Alto that was a mostly black and brown community. And I just thought to myself, like, how do we create the conditions where people can afford to make choices that are better for them? And that the power imbalance is off that you could say, this would be better for me, but I can't make this decision. And so that uh, felt like um, a calling and something important to do was to make sure that the dignity, especially for men like him, that he could, he was taking care of his ex-wife. And I just thought what an amazing um, spirit and gift to be sacrificing that way, but still not be able to afford to better your own life. And that seemed um, not just. I got to go back to your mom because it sounds like she didn't have a ton of help, uh, but she was still making progress forward and you know doing something in this environment that uh, empowered you to feel like you could have your own sense of how things ought to be. Yeah. So, <laughs> so tell tell me about uh, her her journey through um, you know difficult work yeah. uh, to go back to school to you know improve the circumstances. Um, so my mom was a, went, you know, straight out of high school, got a job and had children and, um, and then wanted to improve our lives, her life and all of our lives. And so she went back to school when I was, uh, started about 10. So like it was in the middle for me of childhood and, um, went on welfare. Um, so always had like these random jobs, like she would be selling wood. She would like whatever you could do to be in school and make side income for your kids. And so um, I, I think what she did was really remarkable because I think it takes a lot of courage to um, transform your, like to transform the economy for your family. And, and she sacrificed a lot by, um, you know, being on welfare. And that, those were the days where you could do, um, you could go to school and be on welfare and have support. And so we were in all these programs for moms who um, were going back to school and she went to community college and then to state school. And so I watched her um, triumph in many ways um, of, and she was uh, studying psychology. And so she also had a sense of justice in terms of like mental health and how the system should work. And so watching um, that uh, was very transformative to see her story and to see a lot of like, we were surrounded by a lot of single mamas who were trying to make it work. And I was really lucky that even though my mom was a single mom, um, my dad's mom was very active in our life. And, and his family was very active in our life. And so, um, so yeah, but totally remarkable and um, what she did. Uh, the, the, the support system or the community, was she also from Northern California? How much connection was that uh, for you when you were growing up? Yeah, she was from San Francisco also. Um, but my mother was white and my father was black. And at first her family was shocked. My grandparents moved to Hawaii when my mom <laughs> after I was born. And um, and so a lot of her support came from my dad's family and her friends. And uh, my grandparents, of course, over time um, became fine. 
but we were, I was lucky. I was, we were really loved. We were very, very loved. And mo by these amazing, my aunt and like just fierce women who just like put out their arms around us and were just like willed us to succeed. And um, as I think about like what conditions we create for people to succeed now, it, I think a lot about and interested in kind of what you've seen and observed is how do we create the conditions for success? Because I think like as a, you know, a poor kid with a mom who was a waitress and like trying to figure stuff out, it is the community that willed me to like forward. And I think a lot of places like church, you know, like all the grandmas at the my uh, at my grandma's church, like I just felt like I knew I was loved. I knew I was cared for. I knew I was smart. Um, I never felt so proud of myself as when I was in Jet Magazine because I knew my grandma could take it to church. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, I have made it. Um, but uh, I definitely felt like, uh, even today, I feel like the power of that support. Yeah, I, I think there's a, a conversation that I've been trying to push and, and, a, and a point of view about the importance of opportunity. And mm -hmm. I think so often um, in broader society, people don't think about what opportunity actually means. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's it, one thing for there to be a school present, but mm -hmm. how does the kid get to school? Right. Uh, what's the support in doing homework? Yeah. Um, what's the, you know, what's the culture that's been created either around having books in the home or somebody reading to that child or taking them to the library or those kinds of things that can, they're, they're maybe a little bit more intangible, but they open up you know, opportunity uh, for, for avenues for success. And it takes someone who understands the community and the dynamics to know how to bring that to a child uh, when they might not have it automatically. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And it's interesting because I've been watching a lot of folks involved in uh, technology get active in the conversation around schools and algebra and math and other things. And it's uh, been uh, really uh, fascinating for me to watch because uh, most folks are like get very like stern like we don't need because as people figure out what does curriculum look like they're they're trying to increasingly figure out what does it look like to support kids who don't have all those supports at home and watching a lot of folks in tech kind of push back and say no we need all those demands we need all those things because we can't build the program for the people that need it the most in essence and so um it's been very uh interesting uh, to watch the discussion, especially in the technology community, about how do you build math and science skills um, for people who need it the most? Um, yeah, that that's that's a subject near and dear to my heart. Education, also, we can we can talk about that <laughs> offline and and even ed tech and and how to make it relevant for for all uh, communities. But I, I want to go to labor mm -hmm. in San Jose. Right. I lived yeah. in San Jose from 1999 to 2013, right? Wait, uh, I was there. Yeah, I know. Um, I was working, I was a reporter at the San Jose Mercury News for the first part of that and uh, reporting on, on various things, mostly technology, but also education for a little bit there. And uh, it's such a challenging environment for labor yeah. in that it's expensive to live there. Public transit is broken um yeah. in, in broken up it's never been good it's not like it was yeah, good at yeah, one point yeah, and then no. broken so, so many challenges so tell me um what that experience uh kind of brought you taught you um and how it ties into what you're doing now uh well one uh i just want to acknowledge that Mer san Jose mercury news wrote an uh horrific <laughs> i will separately have a conversation with you about that me, but okay <laughs> no i know it wasn't um uh, what was interesting about San Jose was I was there at a time when uh, Silicon Valley was really developing. And so it was where we saw a change in the nature of the way that people worked. So firms went from employing people directly to increasingly outsourcing. And so it used to be if you worked at a firm, you could have a good job being a janitor at a firm, right? You Because you were an employee, you got benefits, you had a good wage. And so I was there uh, in the early beginning in the early 90s, and we saw a lot of pressure um, for the, a changing nature. Like people who were core to the firm, they started to get a lot of money and everyone else began to be get discarded, right? They weren't considered core to the firm. And so they were outsourced and increasingly immigrants, undocumented folks. And so 
it was uh, hard because I don't think we understood that Silicon Valley was going to win. And I think in the early parts of the labor movement, having discussions about things like stock options to DC, it felt like some weird thing happening in California that wasn't relevant. And especially it was like these young people in the labor movement. And we were like, hey, we think this whole tech thing is going to hit. <laughs> and it has a lot of significance. And I think it wasn't just us. Like when you look at the cars that were manufactured, Ford was saying like, who cares about the Prius? You know, we should be building trucks. And so there was this real pressure, not just in San Jose, but as innovation was happening, larger movements and we're not responding to what was happening in California. So one is just the 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 national conversation. Then um, locally, I actually found uh, San Jose to be incredibly progressive in its politics. And um, it's the place where we were able to do living wages, healthcare for children, and um, and largely because the people that lived there were progressive, the same folks that um, uh, believed in kind of the democratic ideals. And so I think I feel really lucky to have been at a place where you watched a new economy being built, um, but it was really disheartening to be in the labor movement because it was clear as that economy grew that it was discarding the people um, that had been kind of middle class and they went to working class and then increasingly poor. And you could see that from like who used to be a janitor or who used to be a factory worker. Even if you look at, you know, companies like Tesla, that used to be a factory of union workers, right? And then Tesla took over and it became a factory of people working for temp agencies. And so it was interesting to be there at that time and see the impact. Um, what's, what's the... Um what you would view probably as a course correction or shift that could be made um, to, to address that? Or is it too far gone at this point? I mean, now you, there used to be stories about, you know, um, blue collar workers at tech firms who had a bit of stock and, you know, did really well off of the IPO or were able to move up mm -hmm. into other positions. And as you said, as this sort of um, temp and outsource movement has grown, those those opportunities have been sealed off from a lot of people. Um, well, I'm probably different than most CEOs and then I think government has a role. And I don't think it's gonna just be innovation. I think that government is gonna have to play a role in setting standards and providing social infrastructure. And uh, so, I, so I think one, that will have to happen. Um, I also think that the labor movement plays a role, but I, I think that it's a labor movement that has to continue to evolve because things that I thought made sense when I was in the labor movement, like local ordinances, I now understand at scale don't work, right? We would hear business leaders say, we can't just do an ordinance in San Jose. And I thought that's crazy. They're just anti-worker. And now I'm like, oh no, I've operated a business. It's hard to have a different policy in every city. Like do the same thing, I don't care, but just do it everywhere. Um, and so I think the, the labor movement also has to evolve. And then I think there is innovation required and I think companies like Career Karma that is trying to figure out how do people we get trained for um, folks to be able to be developers or in sales. Um, and so I think I think it is a multiple pronged approach. I think have understanding math and science in schools. Like I look at it, we have kids in school, and it still scares me um, that we we paid for coding. We you know like separate of the public system or even a private system that what the kids need, I think, to succeed, they're not being trained for. So I think it is education shifting. I think it's innovation happening. I think it's the labor movement figuring out what role it plays and then ultimately government having some say. I just don't I don't think it's going to happen without all of them. What about the labor movement itself? You bring up an interesting point that I've tried to bring up uh, on air a few times, which is that I'm not sure that the traditional uh, structure and approach of the labor movement is relevant enough to some of the challenges and even opportunities that we see in the economy going forward. Like right now, you mentioned career karma. You know, I would throw guild education in there also. There's a bit more of a, of a push toward making education and training a benefit. And to me, that is so important. Like even going back to the story of your mom and how, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, additional education leading to a job that was structured better kind of opened up doors of opportunity with, with AI coming down the pike and, and even putting more pressure on, uh, you know, jobs that are um, middle class uh, and don't require perhaps higher levels of training and education. How do people who um, 
who want to get on a better trajectory do that? Are there things that the labor movement could be fighting for differently? Well, I think there's one, um, programs like apprenticeship programs, which I think are the best models, right? If you're a construction worker, you go, you work during the day, you get less wages, you go to school at night, but your wages continue to improve as your skill improves the apprenticeship program and ultimately become a journeyman. So I think that's an excellent model and it's paid for by the individuals and by the companies because they see the value in skilled work, right? We, we know that we want bridges where the people are trained. I <laughs> think we know that we want roads where, where, where people are trained. I think the challenge I think for the labor movement is adapting to a different economy. And so I look about issues for us having been at a company that um, uh, looked at like 1099 and W2, like it seems like there's gotta be something different than just 1099 and W2 workers because the current model doesn't work for anyone. And, um, and so I really look forward to a labor movement that is gonna figure out, is there a way? And um, an example is like, if you are a low wage worker and you are in, in 1099, you can work as, as many hours that make sense for you. Whereas if you are an employee at one place and an employee, then we, I would often see people working at multiple places and they were trying to be held under daily overtime rules and other things. It would be interesting to think about social mobility or, you know, like what does it look like for government to play some role or not even the government, but companies to be able to organize in the same way that construction contractors have. Um, and so I, I, I think the labor movement has to continue to evolve. I don't think it is just um, companies I, because there are some really excellent models, um, but we're not seeing enough innovation um, in the labor movement. Now, tell me about the origins of Promise, you know, your relationship with the co-founder and how that started. Um, the, my co-founder, Diana, is one of my favorite friends. Um, we started the company together. We met through someone named Van Jones, who if you watch a different channel, you will see on TV. And uh, uh, Van was going to the White House and I had just left the labor movement. And he and Diana, uh, as young lawyers, had co-founded something called the Ella Baker Center and were now a, a nonprofit called Green for All. And um, I was trying to decide if I was going to go to the White House or to DC and work in government because Obama had just been elected or was I going to stay home with my family? and decided to stay home with my family. And um, Van said, well, I'm gonna go to DC if you're gonna stay here. So I took over the uh, nonprofit that he had just founded and that's how we met. And um, and we worked together there, we worked together. Um, then we went and worked for the Musician Prince and then we worked at a company called Honor. Um, and then we just said, okay, we've been working together now for a lot of years, let's start something that kind of marries all of the things that we've learned uh, together. And so uh, her name is Diana. She's a lawyer by trade. And uh, and she is, I like to just go do things. And she makes sure that I'm doing things that are appropriate and crosses the <laughs> T's and dots the I's. I'm like, we can do this. What do we need that for? And she'll be like, so uh, she's just an incredible partner. Now, I'm glad you mentioned Prince um, because I didn't want to skip over that part. I mean, you, you manage Prince. Um, yeah, like what was like 2014 uh, time period. How does one come to manage Prince? And I mean, nobody's got better stories that are out there than than stories about Prince. The ones that Questlove has oh, sure, you know yeah. told and and whatnot. So like, how how did that happen? A again, through Van actually. Um, Van, I was. Van was like, and uh, Prince had been uh, given donations to the organization that Van started that I ran. And uh, he said, you know, Prince and I talk all the time, but we don't actually do anything. So we want you to come help us figure out how to do something together. <laughs> and he said, we're rhetoric, you're reality. We need a little reality. And I said, okay, cool. And so we met and um, uh, we planned something together. It worked really well. And then... Um, Prince asked Van to help with his master's. And then he was like, okay, you can take Phaedra. And then we ended up making a deal on his master's. And then he just called me and he was like, uh, Phaedra, I want to be your client. And I was like, I don't have clients. I run a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I, I was like, I don't have clients. And, um, and that's how it started. After we got his master's back, he just was like, you're not leaving my side basically. And um, it was interesting because I hadn't been a fan of his, I, I mean, clearly we're all fans, but I hadn't been like, I hadn't bought his music before. And so it was both remarkable 
um, because- Hold a minute, hold a minute, hold a minute. Yeah. You, we grew up in the eighties. Yes. And like, how did, I mean, when, I know exactly how old you were when Purple Rain came out, cause that's yeah. how old I was, like how, what do you mean you never bought any? Well, okay, so I was a young kid. We all have our own life experiences. And I watched Purple Rain and he slapped um, someone in the film for people who haven't watched it. And I just was like, that's a man who hit a woman. And so for me, you know, when you're young and something happens. So I just was like, that's not my people. <laughs> like, and so it's oh, just, yeah. like, it isn't even, of course I knew his music was brilliant, but there's that young part of you that makes a decision at a certain age. And uh, it was a movie again, not reality. But I just, that's how I remembered him is I just was like watching the movie, like, oh, this is fine. And then it just jarred me. And I just was like, oh. And so that just was my uh, youthful impression. And so I just wasn't a fan because of that. Now, having said that, my friends and I did have a routine for When Doves Cry. And I did show Prince and he was not impressed with my routine. <laughs> he was honest with you, even though he wanted to be your client. I was like... Now, did you show, did you have like video of the routine that you no, showed him or did you actually do it for him? I was like, okay, then this. And then he just was like, well, it's good that you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so Prince tells you, I want to be your client. And you're like, I don't have clients. I don't have but clearly, clients. clearly the conversation doesn't end there. So no. he says, here's what I want you to do. And you say what? Like, how does that go? Does Van have to call you and say, hey, look, you need to. Yeah, he, no, he said, like, come spend time with me. And and I just like, I don't know if I was pregnant or he just had a baby. And I just was like, um, it was just I called Van because Van called. I called Van. I said, Prince just called me. And I wasn't even sure if he liked me. Like, I don't. What is this about? And he's like, I don't know. He just called me and asked for your phone number. <laughs> and I was like, OK. And then we went and spent time together. And for a while, I was still doing other things. And um, and then I just was like, he, I feel really lucky that in all these places I'd worked, I got to be with the best people. And I just think if you're going to be in music, he is the most remarkable human and the most brilliant musician. And um, for me, it was a really good learning lesson because I often had a tough job. Like he will he will send you to go get, you know, ice from an Eskimo, as as folks say. Um, I hope. Uh, and I, uh, he he made me confident because I had never been. I had been in a place where I was just like, I'd be like, oh my god, people don't like me. Someone said they're not coming here if I'm here, and he just was like, no, that's your job. Like, buck up, buck up. And um, and so it was really, it was a really really interesting experience. Um, and I feel really lucky to have had such a remarkable time because. I learned, and and I think he is the was the most um, uh, com the most committed leader I've ever seen to the values he believed in. Like he didn't compromise on the things that he believed were righteous, and um, I don't think he gets enough credit for his values. Like he went off Twitter because of uh, police brutality, and people were like, Prince went off Twitter. It was like on CNN, but it was interesting that people didn't make the connection, and so I just think. He did a lot of, he took a lot of radical stands that were very values based and principled that I think even now aren't totally understood. And before Dave Chappelle put on pressure to get his show, you know, the rights for his show back, before Taylor Swift was remaking her songs, right? Uh, Prince had the, the battle over, you know, with the recording industry over his stuff and, you know, writing Slave. Right. Uh, on his, and becoming the artist formerly known as Prince. I think a lot of people forget why right. the symbol and why that. What what did you either learn about that by being yeah. closer to him and seeing how he operates? And how do yeah. you bring that? You're starting to talk about like principle and, and how important that, how do you bring that into business? Um, what I learned was, um, one is, I just think he was always a genius, which is overwhelming to always be ahead of your times. And I think he recognized the value of creating content and that the who should own the content, which I think is really the discussion we're having today as you look at technology is like, is the person who creates the content the owner or is the platform the owner? And he believed that the person who created the content was the owner. And what was so innovative about him is that he worked to create his own platform. 
So right, like he had NPG Music Club where they sent out their own music. He was the first one to put music into newspapers to try to think about how um, sales were done. And so I just, I think he was um, ahead of his time. And I think um, he paved the way, I think for people like Taylor Swift. I am so, like, I feel like cheering for her. I'm so happy for her. I, when she was re-recording her music and then releasing it, I was like, this is like as good as it gets. Um, but he really recognized, and I think the power of ownership of the content and I think part of what made technology so interesting for me is watching artists and a lot of legacy artists have their content devalued, both lack of ownership, but also the introduction of platforms devaluing their content. And so I just think um, it was incredible for me as a business to watch. And because he was who he was, like he, money was important, but principle was more important. And so it was like shocking to be in a room where you could say, like, he, I remember he, we took all his music off every platform and he just was like, it doesn't matter. I can make more money, you know, like this. And he's like, it's the, you know, like just all my music off and having to have a conversation with Apple. Like, so we, we want to take all of our music off of um, all, all of the streaming services and uh, having that conversation and then watching, I think Dave Chappelle, watching Taylor Swift, but also watching Jay-Z and watching what he's done with a title like if you look at like that was really about owning a platform and um and seeing kind of what rock nation has done and so i think there's a lot of models of of what it looks like and i think as we look to the future for a lot of people it, and that's what as we think about is it nfts or other things it's like how do we think about is it cryptocurrency is it decentralization how do we think about what uh what will exist in the future in terms of how to control what you uh, create? Yes. Um, well, ahead of his time there, too. Uh, I always ask uh, founders, CEOs, executives about what I call Death Valley, lowest point, because yeah. I think there's a lot of learning in how you get through that. So would you say, what would you say was the most difficult thing or period for you, either career-wise or outside of that, um, was there a point where you sort of hit a wall and thought, whatever plans I had, whatever ambition, it's not working out. I'm going to have to change, switch gears completely. Yeah, um, I, I, I've had a, a number of those points, which I hope most people have. <laughs> um, I think my most recent point was. Uh, starting this company and making a pivot from serving the criminal justice system to figuring this point out. And one, I was really nervous because there aren't a lot of black women that have raised a lot of venture capital. So I was worried if I didn't succeed, how it would impact other people and their ability to raise. And, um, and so I just thought like, one, if I fail, I'm going to not just fail for myself, but I'm going to fail for a lot of people. And and also the people that we'd hired and the people whose services, like people who depended on our resources. And then I felt like shame for myself and my family. Like, are my kids going to be embarrassed and feel like I'm a failure? And um, and so that was really hard for me because I knew I hadn't achieved what I set out to achieve. And I didn't feel like I, I hadn't grown up with the privilege of failure. And so it was the first time where I was like, oh, I'm not just going to fail, but I'm going to fail big. And... I didn't grow up where like people are like, oh, great, you failed. Let's learn from it. It's you know, like, uh, and so, so it was a really uh, hard moment because I thought I had um, harmed multiple people and I, and I couldn't see the path forward. And so what was, what was the learning? Um, mm -hmm. Where did you go to, uh, get the perspective you needed to work through that. Do you still see it the same way or did, did something or someone help you shift? Um, I, I, I think I was really lucky um, that we had um, incredible investors and people who believed in us that made it. And I just hadn't seen people fail and like move on. And, uh, and so I was like, it was interesting that all of the people around us were just like, oh, yeah, you just pivot and then you do this or, you know, like, oh, it's cool. Like you one of our investors was like, well, you can always return the money and then come back. And I was like, oh, like, that's how people do this. Like, <laughs> like they just fail and then they just like come back. And <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I just, I, that's not, was not the world in which I came from. Um, but uh, I think what I realized is a, a couple of things. Um, one is I care, I care deeply about um, the problems we're solving. And I didn't know, I think venture uh, capital is unique in that you, you don't have to make profit right away. You have to grow impact. And so I thought whatever I did, I wanted to grow impact. And so I didn't know a better way to serve. I didn't like, what was I going to go do? And so I was like, we have money in the bank. We, people know who we are. So it's not like they ever expected we're going to do things that were not consistent with who we wanted to be. And, um, and so it was really, it was a, it was a really important time. And um, I walked away and realized that, um, and I, and I don't know about other, other people, but I grew up where you're like responsible for your block. Right. So I always felt responsible for like my friends, my family, like I was like financially. And so it was a good learning lesson for me because I was, I realized I only, one, I'm only responsible for the people I brought into this earth in terms of like actually being responsible. And, and then the question is like, how are you going to be all right with yourself? Like, what will I feel good? So for me, it was like, what will my grandmother be proud of? What will my kids be proud of? What will I be proud of? And so it meant going forward and, and we had, I had a good co-founder. We had a lot of support and, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to fail. Um, and I definitely see it differently now because I now feel like I have the benefit of failure. Like the world wouldn't have ended. And when you're in that moment, it just feels like every, like you're going to go over and people are like, you suck, you failed, you destroyed the world. Now no black women can have money, you know, like, which is so obnoxious as a human to think you're responsible, you know, like, like. I'm like, uh, I, you know, I was obnoxious by my own self thinking I was that important to everyone. You know, like it's, um, so now I, I think one, I deserve to fail. And two, if I do, um, you know, that it, it will be, I will fail myself more than anyone else. Uh, you keep using the word fail and yeah. I get it like, yes, yeah. you know, but you yeah. used it a lot and I wasn't sure. I, I'm still not sure that you failed. I mean, I mean, there's, I there's fail, the... now looking back, it doesn't look like a failure because the business is doing better. Right. So, you know, like if you look at it today, you would say, oh, your business was valued at, you know, 20 million. It's valued at 500 million. It's, you know, like it's you would say, oh, the business is doing better. But in the moment I'm going to my investors saying, I don't want to sell our product anymore. And I had an experience. And so to go to sell your investors, I don't know what I'm doing. What's my path forward? And I don't want to sell the product I have. That's where I was. I was like, oh, I'd been in a couple of places. I was like, I don't want to sell products to these people. I think we're going to harm people if we keep doing this product. I don't know where we should go. And so for me being like, do you want your money back? <laughs> Felt like a failure. Yeah, that sounds, when you tell it that way, at that <laughs> moment, yes, it sounds right. like you were failing, but somehow you did not fail. Yes, and I, yes. Right. Because was it was failing. more a bet on you that the investors yes. were making and that the vision exactly and the principle than on the product as implemented at the moment. The, that is the exact conversation I had with Bill Trenchard at first round. As I called and said, do you want your money back? Um, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like this. And I can give you your money back. And he was like, no, we made a bet on you. We knew who you were. We knew you would never want to do something that you felt was predatory. Now it's clear it's not working out. Go in the woods, <laughs> you know, do what you need to do. And that's what we did. And that's what gave us the space to do the ticket stuff because, you know, then when the city was like, okay, we're not going to do it. I was like, well, we have capital. We'll just pay people. In the beginning, we paid people's tickets because we couldn't convince the government to work with us. Now they work with us and they take the risk. But in the beginning, we just took the risk. And that was because we had capital. Um, and so, yes, it, we didn't fail, but at the time calling people back and saying, do you want your money? Cause I don't want to do this company anymore. Definitely felt like failing. So is there a tool in your toolbox now, leadership wise, management wise, vision wise from that experience that you're going to continue to use when you run into situations where something in the business isn't working out? Yeah. What's the, what's the core belief you got from, from this situation? Um, I think the core belief is that to your point about failure, like now I realize it isn't failure, it's growth and it didn't feel like growth, but now even when it's hard, which I think we get in our personal lives, right. But professionally I didn't get is that it's like, okay, now 
what is the opportunity? Because it seems like the best innovation comes out of those moments of like what feels like chaos and the end of the road when you just have to figure something out. And so now I don't want the chaos, but I definitely want the inspiration and the growth. Um, and the the best thing that happened to me is I started coaching and the and my coach said to me, um, great things are, are accomplished in hard times. And the only way to get through hard times is to get through hard times. And so now I just am like, I just got to, you got to go straight through it. You can't, there's no shortcut. You just got to go straight through it. And so um, now I'm just like, this is, this is growth and I'm just going to get through it. Huh. Okay. So now uh, let, let's go back to promise again and tell me how much does the vision and the addressable market even expand in 2022, 2023. Um, is it about geographic expansion? Is it about where where are you looking? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as a growth stage company, we're always looking for expansion. And for us, it's it's twofold. One is it's expansion geographically. Um, uh, we're in a lot of the major cities right now. Um, we want to continue to do that. We'd like to do national instead of state or local. Uh, in addition, I should say not instead of. Um, and then it's expansion of services. Uh, we just got bank approval for a payroll cards. So we're going to partner with someone to do that. We are working with, um, we, we, we want to be able to offer a full suite of financial services for people that are not predatory and easy to access. Because what we realized is when we looked at, like, for example, how people pay us, most people pay us on a prepaid debit card. And, um, and, and we think those things should be easier and that people who, um, uh, have less should have the same opportunities to have good products and services. And that's one of the hard things, right? Is in this whole, not just FinTech, but financial services movement, the benefits are given to the people who don't need them. Like if you look at loyalty, you know, points right. and loyalty and all that stuff, right. it's like the, the people who, who need the assistance are given the higher interest rates and the people who don't are given <laughs> loyalty right. no, points. It's, like, it's, right. it's like hard to get help. That was the thing we discovered when we did aid. It's like, all, you got to bring your taxes. We're like, why are you making it hard as a government to get money? They don't get the money. You get the money. Why are you making it hard for them? And um, I think it is harder to be poor, right? The system, and, and I think a lot about like Uber, it's like trickle down, right? Black car service. And then at the end, we get the like, you know, get paid less, get less of a service. And so what we're trying to understand is what is an economic model? What does a company look like where you start with the richest resources at the bottom of the economy and you move up? And so for us, like we have a 93% repayment rate. And I think it's because people want to pay their bills and our software is designed as though they want to pay their bills, not as though we're punishing them for choosing not to. It, my experience growing up, I think the experience of every of our clients is it's a, it's a question of lack of resources. No one needs different training. <laughs> No one needs to be punished or make it harder. We need to make it easier for people to get good services and people want to pay their bills. It's not, you know, it's, it's very basic. Well, um, it, it's certainly a, a market and a customer base that hasn't gotten enough attention. So um, th there's room for growth and uh, both personally uh, and corporately. Uh, just, Phaedra, thanks for sharing Promise's story, then also sharing your story with me on Fortnite. Thanks for having me.